Uh, but without much ado, let me just introduce to us, uh, uh, to you, the uh, plenary panel here. Uh, the good thing about the speaker, uh, the main speaker, the plenary pan panel is that you actually do not need to introduce him because everyone knows him. <laughs> so, Mohsen Hamid, <laughs> please do come up. And Mohsen is going to be in conversation with our very own Dr. Vaseem Anwar, who has been a colleague of mine at Foreman Christian College, but is now at Canade College. And they shall have a conversation on challenging truths. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, good morning, and uh, all the best wishes. And welcome, actually, to all the truth seekers, I mean, who could make it on this freezing day today. Um, challenging truths, and I think that's the topic. So uh, there are different ways of looking at it. and. Uh, I think one of the truths that Lahore is about is love, and uh, love of all kinds. So Lahore in itself is love. And I think we all wait for more love in this freezing, sneezing, cold weather, and Mohsen, I hope you agree with that. So maybe more coming from you on those themes. Uh, particularly when we don't have even power, logistic or political. So there is a lot that we await. I would like uh, to begin with, before we uh, uh, have some formal questions, to wrap a record, and maybe you would like to say yes or no, but just correct, correct me if I'm wrong, that you were born in 1971, right? Yes. yes. Okay. That uh, you have British and Pakistani nationalities, both of them, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. That you are a literary fiction writer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that you were at Princeton in 1993 and your th uh, senior thesis was there Sustainable Power, Integrated Resource Planning in Pakistan. That's yeah. true, yes. Okay. You were in Harvard in 1997 and you worked on corporate law. Not, I mean, took one course in corporate law, but yeah. Okay, I, I, yeah. I, I but some, okay. That you studied under Joyce Carol Oates and Tony Morrison and did some workshops there that uh, brought you to creative writing? Yeah, at Princeton, not at Harvard, yeah. Great. Okay, that you were in London as well in 2001 with Wolf Ollins advertising uh, to be declared, and this is you need to explain to me. First ever chief storyteller officer. What is that? And this is in 2015, right? Do you want me to answer that now? Yeah, please, please, please. So, um, when I finished uh, uh, law school, I needed a job. So, I got a job as a consultant in New York for a few years, and I worked on my first novel, uh, Moth Smoke, which came out in, in 2000, and, um, and then started my second novel and moved to London, uh, left my job at McKinsey, mm -hmm. was uh, in Lahore trying to write this book, um, running out of savings, and I got approached by this firm, uh, Wolf Olins, which is a branding firm, to come to London and work for them. And um, uh, I didn't really want a job, but uh, I needed to do something because it was taking forever to write this book. And uh, a friend of mine said, look, just go to London. and." ask for what you would need to um, make you say yes. So I went to London and I said, look, I can only work three days a week and these are my requirements. And they said, fine. So I began consulting with them and then I started doing two days a week and then one day a week and then no days a week um, and came back to Lahore. Um, and while living in Lahore, a friend of mine uh, who I had hired when I was running the London office of Wolf Olins, um, became the CEO of Wolf Olins and said, look, we should work together. And we, we met in Dubai, actually. I was there for something, and he was there for something. Um, and we got chatting, and over a sort of fun dinner, we came up with this idea that, you know, we would call my role Chief Storytelling Officer. That's great. We all can have more of them. So, so that, that, yeah. was, that was the background. Thank you. Okay, what I learned more about you, and I'm using your vocabulary, actually, from discontent, uh, and uh, what is that discontent and its civilizations and maybe you have quoted them there and I, I don't know if you are uh, that but mongrel yes miscegenator I suppose yeah half-breed 
outcast, deviant, heretic, hybrid, half outsider, mingler, mixer, divided, discontented. Is that something you would like to explain on? Yeah, I think that um, uh, there's some people who I suppose are very fortunate in feeling that you know, they are completely from one place mm. and they fit into that place. Or at least they think that. Um, others of us have a very difficult time doing that. In my case, when I was three, we moved to California. My father is a university professor. He was then, he still is a university professor in Lahore now. Um, so 1974, moved to Stanford to do his PhD. I mm -hmm. went to California. I spoke Urdu and Punjabi. Um, and uh, the, when I got there, um, I quickly forgot my Urdu and Punjabi. I learned English, moved back to Pakistan in 1980. Mm. At that point, I didn't speak a word of Urdu and Punjabi. And so I tried to relearn my first languages. But I was a pretty much a Californian boy. So I'd been a Pakistani boy, completely shocked in California. Then I was a Pakistani boy, again, shocked in 1980s Pakistan. Then I went back to America, came back to Pakistan. Mm. And so as a result, you know, I'm a kind of mixed up sort of creature. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, not entirely of any one place or disposition. Okay. Thank and, you. And I think for much of my life, I thought, you know, let me find a way to hide this and sort of pretend that I fit in with everybody else, whether I'm in London or New York or Lahore. But at a certain point, I realized, look, you know, maybe instead of trying to pretend that I'm like everybody else, mm -hmm. I should consider that everybody else is like me, which is to say that everybody is a kind of misfit. And, um, and so if you're the only girl with four brothers, you're mm. a misfit. If you are you know, a poet in a family of engineers, you're a misfit. You mm. know, if you are um, somebody who reads novels on planet Earth in the 21st century, you're you know, a misfit. So, um, so I began to realize that mm. actually, instead of, instead of feeling um, separated from other people, by this sense of being kind of hybridized, mongrel, strange creature, um, I should be open to the idea that everybody else maybe feels a bit strange too. Mm. And that this is in fact a kind of connection instead of a separation. Thank you for putting so many in yourself. And that's great. And yet you are actually in 2013, the 100 leading global thinker. And I think he deserves an applaud on that. Mm. So. You are a writer, of course, but you are an author first. And I'll go into details about authorship later on, which is how authorial you are. But let me pick on other things. Discontent and its civilizations. And we can see, okay, I'm not going to put civilization in a bracket anywhere. But uh, what comes to my mind is Sigmund Freud. So is it an inversion of Sigmund Freud, or how do you look at it? Can you explain a bit on this? So the title of this, this book is that um, it is an inversion of, of civilization and its discontents, the, you know, the seminal book by Freud. But um, the, the book basically uh, takes the position that it is, in fact, our discontents, mm -hmm. the things that annoy us, anger us, make us feel the world is unfair that causes us to very often gravitate to structures that we say that, look, we belong to a particular group of people. Mm -hmm. We belong to Punjabis, or we belong to Pakistanis, or we belong to Muslims, or we belong to whatever's, uh, PTI, PMLN, you know. Um, and, that, and, that, uh, and that in some ways, it's not that, um, it's not that our tribes hmm. give rise to our conflicts, but that it's our conflicts that give rise to our tribes. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, and this is psychological as well, along with sociological, when we talk about discontent? I, mean, I think everything is psychological along with hmm. sociological. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, author, as far as I know, and you are writing in English by choice, right? By necessity. While you are a Punjabi? By necessity. By necessity. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting question because uh, the language question is very important, I think. Yes. So, so it would be one thing if I were equally fluent in English and Urdu and I chose to write in English. Mm -hmm. But I'm not equally fluent in Urdu and English. 
I was much more fluent in Urdu than English. And until you think I was in English three. as well? I think mostly in English. But I think also what happens is that for many people, you know, language is something that occurs over mm -hmm. the journey of your life. And in my case, the way that my journey has happened, although Urdu was my first language, uh, I forgot it. And then Urdu, English became my, my second language, but I didn't have a first language. And then I relearned Urdu when I was you know, nine or 10, and so it became my third language. I don't really have a first language because the, my mother tongue yeah. is forgotten. And so in terms of writing, you know, if I were to attempt to write a book in Urdu, it would be mm -hmm. so horrifically, you know, uh, bad that it doesn't bear thinking about. Yeah. But, but also I think it's important because we often imagine that there's a great politics attached to the language in which we choose to speak. There is, of course. And, and there is a politics, but sometimes the politics is not what we think. So in my case, um, uh, you know, it's like, you know, it, it's like if you grew up in Pakistan and you could have been a fantastic sitar player. Mm -hmm. But you just happened to learn the guitar and you became reasonably good at it. You know, at that point to say that, you know, you should be playing the sitar because that's mm -hmm. the instrument of your homeland um, is an impossibility. So for me, it's not that I prefer to write in English or mm -hmm. I think that, you know, English opens up the world or that uh, uh, it actually comes to the fact that the instrument that I learned to play much better happened to be Okay, thank you. And I ask this question particularly because I think many of my students uh, who are English literature major are creative writers and would like to actually write in English. So things get open for them. Thank you so much. It, it's also interesting because, you know, what I find is that in Pakistan today, um, when you speak at university campuses, mm -hmm. it's interesting how many of these young people do read in English. And whether you're talking to somebody who's a student in, in Islamabad or Peshawar or Karachi or Lahore, um, on our university campuses today, many, many young people um, are learning, are reading in English. Yeah. And so there is a, 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 an English language literary tradition yes. that exists in Pakistan, which is not some external thing. Right. And in fact, it's partly because I think that young people realize when they're 18 years old, because English is usually the third language. They had some language they learned at home. Right. And then at some point they got taught Urdu in school. And then they go to college and discover that actually they need to have English. And English is this language of power. The constitution is in English. If you want a job abroad, you need to know English. And so people understand that there's something there. But um, I've never really had the feeling that English was not a Pakistani language. I mean, Thank that's you for a, saying that's that. That's a convenient think, yeah. thing for me to say, but I actually, you know, um, I remember speaking to this young woman who came to this um, Lord Lit Fest many years ago, and she was a professor at uh, uh, Edwards College in Peshawar, mm -hmm. and she would teach Dutton Fundamentalist to 500 young students with, you know, photocopied uh, editions. Um, and she would talk about the conversation that they would have. And I remember thinking that, you know, that uh, uh, we, we often get very caught up in this notion that, you know, there's something, there's a kind of foreign plot mm -hmm. or some sort of in service of foreign mm -hmm. interests. Mm -hmm. um, there's something fundamentally disloyal about the idea of, of writing in English. You know, wh why, why is this happening? I but, keep telling my students that, yes, sometimes we, we do breathe in English as well. Yeah. I think we own English now, and we got to own it. So I'm not a propagandist for that, but yeah, I think that's a reality. And, so. and the last thing I would say about this is that um, it is also a mistake to imagine that English only comes to Pakistan from outside. It is also the case that English is made in Pakistan also. For the, and goes into the world. Right. So we do have a degree of ownership yes. over this language. Um, it's something that, that we too own. And Pakistan has a huge number of English-speaking people. We're one of the largest in the world. Yes. Um, but an author is a person who invents and also causes something, uh, which I believe is known to be authentic. I don't know whether it is or not, but that there is always, uh, what author does is it, he in, or she increases originates, promotes, and that happens with all the authors, so you are no different. But let's, I think, go back to the title once again, Challenging Truths, and I was looking at it from an adjectival perspective, 
with its verbal connotations. And I think uh, it's on the back flap of your latest novel, The Last White Man by Tayari uh, Jones, right? That you are challenging truths, that you have challenging truths around you, and that you very much contest for it. Is that true? I mean, so what sort of truths those are that you find challenging and you pick on as your themes? I mean, one thing I think for me, um, in some ways I feel very fortunate to have moved back to Pakistan in the 1980s, you know, under the Zawal Haq uh, mm -hmm. dictatorship. Because um, uh, it, in a way, for many of us, I think at that time, it inoculated us against a certain, we talk often about how under General Zia, you know, society was changed and in many ways that many of us uh, think of as fairly horrific. But, but there are also, um, there's also the effect of that when you live in a state um, with, you know, such, uh, uh, such deep hypocrisy and such, um, in a sense, a kind of a, um, a, a state-sponsored narrative so mm -hmm. at odds with what your eyes and ears are telling you, even the history. You begin, in a way, to de develop a degree of skepticism. Mm -hmm. I think actually that's very useful. Um, I remember being in India uh, maybe 15 years ago for some literary festival or book launch or whatever, back when it was possible to go. I haven't been to India in many years. It's, it's impossible to get visas to go anymore. But um, back then, I remember talking to journalists then saying, you know, it's interesting because um, you seem to have, so many of you seem to have bought into this jingoistic idea that, you know, India is this and India is that and we have been wronged and this, which reminds me so much of America. In America in the post 9-11 moment, you saw, you know, completely, you know, false accounts of what was happening and this very nationalistic sort of turn. And I thought, it, you know, to me, it's very interesting how so few of my friends who are journalists in Pakistan um, uh, or, or, you know, intellectuals or writers or whatever, um, uh, think in this way, mm -hmm. that there's a de great degree of skepticism about these sorts of narratives. And so um, you asked a question about challenging truths. Right. I think that, you know, when a country or society tells you that this is the truth mm -hmm. um, and insists upon saying that this is the truth, in a sense, one is left with no other alternative but to challenge the truth. Mm. Um, you know, uh, it's like when we were told that, you know, the air quality is fine. It's, it's the air quality monitors, you know, that are lying to us. A few years ago, if you remember in Lahore, this was being said. It's a perfect example of this. We could all tell, you know, our asthmatic friends were in hospital. Our children were coughing when they would go out to do their sports. We could barely breathe. Our sinuses were clogged up. But yet but we were told that... But in today's world, alternative truths are equally dangerous, aren't they? Well, what I, what I wanted to say was that, was that, that truth is something that needs to be contested. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so in Pakistan, I think that we, in a sense, have to contest truth because it's, it's at this point, you know, false truth has been shoved down our throats for so long that it becomes almost a gag reflex to, to challenge it. But as, as you say, you know, alternate truths, I think, is, what, is that what you said? Yes. Or alt truth, which is a very so, popular term. Yeah. So I think, you know, I remember the first time I saw that interview with, with uh, uh, President Trump's um, uh, spokesperson, I think her name was Kellyanne mm -hmm. Conway. Mm -hmm. And some journalist was saying, you know, you were saying that it was the biggest attendance at any, you know, presidential thing in history, but we saw photographs, the thing is half empty. How can you say it was bigger than Obama's inauguration, etc.? You know, and she's, uh, and, you know, the facts are the facts. And she said, well, you have your facts, but we have alternative facts. Hmm. And um, I, I hadn't heard that expressed. It was one of these times when, you know, from a very un strange source, you hear this kind of words of, of evil wisdom yeah. or whatever you want to call so it. So where lies the truth? In but, but, fiction uh, or in fact? But just to, just to conclude this point, um, it reminded me of when you know, Donald Rumsfeld talked about the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. And, you know, this guy had presided mm -hmm. over this disastrous uh, invasion. But, but in that idea of the unknown unknowns was actually a very interesting concept. Anyway, so I, I remember thinking about this alternate facts thing. Yeah. And, and um, uh, I think what has happened is 
that um, facts have been debased on all sides. Mm -hmm. um, that facts have also been debased, for example, by experts. So we are told that, you know, the economy is doing fantastically, let's say. Right. And yet most people see their lives are getting worse. Or we are told that, you know, um, this Somebody is would say it's not cold. Huh? Yeah. Or, or, I mean, you know, uh, in area after area, we are told things by experts that seem to be untrue. And so there's a reaction to that. Mm. Um, so anyway, I think I won't go on on this, but I think that, that, that you know, alternate facts that are simply false mm. are obviously um, uh, not true. But we live in a moment where due to technological change, the way at which we arrive at what truth is, mm is being changed, experts are being challenged, and so there's a real flux about what is actually true and what is actually okay, fact. Coming back to your authorship and going back a bit in time, uh, just I would like to see you, how you evolve as an author. Are you authorial? I mean, are you authority uh, driven when you create? Do you let your characters breathe on their own or do you just make them the way you want them to be or behave. So what do you do with your characters? What sort of novels do you write? Um, so I, uh, I, I often, um, okay. I okay. often you know, describe the writing process. Often young yeah. writers will come and say, okay, so, you know, right, what, right. how do you make this stuff or what do you write? Yeah, but if you can be specific about, I mean, how authorial you are, how authority driven you are, omnipotent, potent, what is your narrative and how free you leave your characters to behave and Okay, do I, I'm going to try to answer this specifically, mm -hmm. um, but I, it's a little bit difficult for me to do because I don't think in those terms. Okay. I'm a critic. Sorry. So, so, and I think I think that this is one of those examples, yeah. right? Where, in a sense, where um, there may be discourse about writing and the yeah. ideas of you know what is authority and yeah. how authorial are you. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I never think about that. It's like you know when somebody okay. says you know uh, not to equate myself to you know Federer or to one of these great sports people, but but an artist and a, and a, in a sense a tennis player might be similar. You know, what is Federer thinking mm. when he does that, you know, beautiful backhand? The truth is he's not thinking anything, you know, right. he's just sort of in the moment smiling at the ball and sending it across. So, um, let me no, ask, no, let but, me ask. But I want to, one no, second, one ahead, second. I, I want to just, um, now, uh, I think what you're asking in this question is um, how do I think of my own relationship uh, uh, with regards to the characters in my books and to what extent do I think it is me or opposed to them? Exactly. Maybe. So if that's what you mean by authorial. Um, Call it presence in absentia. I, I, I don't believe that the characters in my books have an independent existence in that sense. Okay. And the reason why is that I don't think that when I write a character, there's a separate person out there that I have made. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is when I write a character, what I am doing is imagining being them. So it is less to me like taking a photograph of somebody sitting in the audience. Mm -hmm. And it is more like being an actor trying to play this person. So when I'm writing a character, man, woman, young, old, what I am doing is in a sense trying to be this person. Okay. And in the act of trying to be this person, in a sense, if you're the actor playing this character, but also the playwright who's writing the play, it's a bit mixed up. So uh, the, the, the character is not some separate thing mm -hmm. that is, let me let them breathe and follow their course. Um, you know, let's see, let the chips fall where they may. But, um, uh, but rather it is in a sense, um, like my son pretends to be a dinosaur on a regular mm -hmm. basis mm -hmm. and he walks around the house, you know, roaring and he comes into the study and he, you know, and, and terrifies me by roaring next to my ear. He's 10 and uh, does less now, but when he was nine, he did this a lot. He should do more. In, in this, <laughs> what, you know, who is he? Is he himself? Is mm -hmm. he the character? Hmm. 
I think what fiction is about is blurring that boundary. When you make fiction, you are pretending to be other people. When you read fiction, you are allowing other people to exist inside you. You are animating them in your imagination. So this question of authority, mm -hmm. it suggests a separation of two things, the writing and the writer, okay. as two separate things, one of whom has authorship over the other. What I think is more interesting is the blurring of these two things. Okay. And if you put it in more of a, let's say, a context, given that some of the ancient writers we have here from Data Saab al Hajberi on, um, in our tradition, in the Sufi poetic tradition in particular, um, that tradition is fundamentally about, about blurring. Mm -hmm. That the lover and the beloved are, in a sense, poised to merge. Sure. Now, that is very much, I think, how I think about writing as well. So it's difficult for me to tell you, do I have authority or do I have whatever? Does the okay. moth have authority over the candle flame? Who Thank knows? Thank you. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. Uh, so there is still going on that mingling and mixing, which is part of you. So, of course, that comes into your authorship as well. Uh, going back in time, uh, moth smoke and reluctant fundamentalist. Uh, I think you, in one of the interviews, did say, okay, you want your readers to read twice your work, particularly Reluctant Fundamentalist. So are there gaps? Loss of values, definitely. But then are you rejecting all these Huxley's, Orwell's, Fitzgerald's? And then you uh, are trying to actually build a new world uh, which I looked at in these two particular works, like, is it uh, angry young man? Is there, a, is there a reaction to the conditions? How do you look at them? I mean, as a reaction to what is what is happening? How do moths work in? Yeah, yeah, in these two novels. Um, like one is a nuclear Pakistan um, post nuclear Pakistan situation. The other one is 9/11. And in both these novels, I mean, the protagonist is like either angry or made angry, something. Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I, I suppose. I mean, uh, uh, so Mott's book for me, uh, uh, certainly the protagonist is angry. And, um, you know, uh, I suppose I was angry. Uh, I think I still am angry. It's mm -hmm. sort of difficult to be from mm -hmm. Pakistan, mm -hmm. to look around you at the enormous talent, history, culture, all around you, and not be angry at what is going on, right? Like, why is it like this? Yeah. Um, it could be so, so much better. And in a sense, that sense of of anger at the at the at the disparity between what is possible and what is is there, and in Mott Smoke, um, that anger expresses itself, you know, in in the form of this character. But Mott Smoke is is also, of course, a love story, because um, uh, you know Mott Smoke was uh, a love story to 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 Lahore to a particular mode of being. I think so was the reluctant fundamentalist yeah. as well. That was mm -hmm. also a love story. And in mm -hmm. a sense, you know, Moth Smoke, the, the title mm -hmm. is, the, is the suggestion. For me, Moth Smoke really did flow on from a, a Sufi poetic tradition that I took very seriously. Okay. And, um, and, you know, how and why. Hmm. Uh, uh, one of the things that's quite interesting about, about you know, our uh, poetic tradition uh, is, is some of its formal aspects, that very often we see a direct address to the you, hmm. that um, there isn't something happening out there, that you are implicated, that, that we are speaking to the beloved directly, the beloved is the you, and this you could also be the listener of the song, the reader of the poem, uh, the beloved themselves. And so this idea of, of blurring the boundary between writer and reader um, was very interesting to me. Hmm. And, and so I wanted to, in a way, write a kind of post-modern, post slightly disenchanted take 
on this kind of a love. Yeah, while narrative. you blur, which is of course very good to do, but then you also blur borders. I mean, if we move to, say, Filthy Rich and then onwards, there is a lot of anonymity in your works. You don't want to identify people. That's, I mean, that's my take on it. Does this, is this part of some haunting effect or was it, it what is it that you want to not reveal? Can you just tell me? Yeah, so um, the journey towards writing books that don't identify a place mm -hmm. and don't have too many characters named and in a sense um, are de-specified in some ways. Right. Is, is a journey that um, I can sort of talk about in terms of, of how I, I got there as a writer. So I wrote this book, Mott Smoke, and um, it was you know a novel about lots of things, young people, hash, love. And particularly Chinggis Khan and Dara Shikoo. I mean. and, and, and a historical yeah. tradition, um, which in a sense uh, uh, reimagined the contest mm -hmm. uh, between uh, Dara and Aurangzeb um, in a reversed modern context. But um, so I wrote this book and it mm -hmm. was sort of, you know, in a way inspired by Lahore, inspired by Pulp Fiction. It was kind of a hodgepodge of, of, of the different aspects of things that made me me. In a way, it was looking at Lahore through my eyes, which were, you know, partly Americanized eyes. And then I wrote a novel called The Latin Fundamentalist, which was looking at America, really after this 9-11 moment, with eyes that were still quite Pakistanized. Hmm. They were both, in a sense, hybrid novels, and the gaze was slightly different in each. Now, after this, um, in a sense, uh, I remember there was this sort of critique that I began to hear, which is, you know, you've set yourself up as a representative of Pakistan. Hmm. Who are you to represent Pakistan? You know, uh, uh, this is, this is, uh, I remember thinking about this, you, you, you're even maligning Pakistan, you're saying we're all terrorists. I think the book right. actually was the opposite of that. Uh -huh. It was, it, it doesn't say that we're all terrorists. It actually asked the question of how do we become suspicious of each other in the and first place. And you've got place. all kinds of readership. I can understand but, that. But what I want to say, what I want to say about this is that, is that on the one hand, I thought this critique was ridiculous. On the other hand, I thought I have to take this seriously. Mm -hmm. You know, there was this notion that you, you sort of take Pakistan's cultural patrimony. You're like a strip mining corporation, mm -hmm. you know, you dig up the bauxite and the iron ore and you send it to abroad and you leave a wasteland. Um, and I thought this is ridiculous, but on the other hand, I thought, you know, it is true that the center of economic gravity of publishing is outside of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And while I may not think it's my intention, how do I know that I'm not engaged in some kind of cultural strip mining of Pakistan mm. for globalized export? It's not something that could be dismissed so easily. So what I did in my third novel was I tried to and um, set myself the task of interrogating what I do. And I said, I will write a novel that doesn't use the word Pakistan, mm -hmm. doesn't use the word Islam, doesn't in any way talk about a specific place but we'll still use Lahore hmm. as a template for the universal city. And I found that, although my initial impulse was to somehow interrogate whether I was self-exoticizing this place and somehow engaged in doing the very thing that some people thought I was doing, out of it what I found was something quite beautiful to me, which was maybe Lahore is the universal city. Maybe actually if you take Lahore as your starting plate, and you write about an unnamed city, hmm. every city in the world will be echoed in what Lahore contains. In other words, every city could be the universal city. So as I began to move down this, this path, in a way, I guess I wound up writing these novels that were somewhat despecified, initially so that I could make sure to myself that I wasn't exoticizing for foreign consumption Pakistan, mm -hmm. but stumbling into a sort of formal way of working, which was to say, you know, maybe there are universal things that, that we ascribe to, you know, you can, you can say New York is a universal city, or you mm -hmm. can say that, that London is a universal city, but they're not. Yeah, in this third novel that you are referring to, and of course, I mean, richness is filthy, and Asia is rising, and amid all economic crisis and struggle, we see a lot of ambition, along with love, 
But don't you think there is a lot of greed as well, selfishness? So is that like both of these things present? Yeah, so, um, uh, and I, I, I'm seeing that we have only two minutes left, so I'll try to, um, I'll try to wrap up, but, um, so in How to Get Filthy and Rising. I was told we have like 20 minutes still. Can you check on that, please? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so in, in How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, uh, I moved back to Lahore in 2009, and, um, and what I was really struck by after being away for a while was um, how money had become even more central hmm. to life in Lahore and in Pakistan than it had been before. That, um, oh, 15 minutes. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, and and in how, in a sense, much as we talked about other religious matters, um, that money had really become, in a sense, our national religion. That, um, that, that older systems of class and uh, uh, even clan were being supplanted hmm. by a very precarious economic existence and then an incredibly stratified economic structure. Right. And so, in a sense, the, the, uh, the pressure of, of and, and the desire to show success in terms of money and to suffer mm. enormous consequences of a lack of money became um, at the heart of what I wanted to explore. So it, in a sense, the idea of a, a novel about how to get filthy rich in rising Asia, um, it was, um, it was a, I guess, a questioning of a kind of religion of money. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can go on and on, but I think I'm coming to your next one, 2017 Exit West. Why exit west? I mean, a lot of exit is happening from east to west. So why exit west, except I heard Brexit? So what is the take here? Why is the novel called this? Exit west. Mm. I mean, exit is happening east to west. I can, we can, you can see a lot of talent going from east to west. So why this title, exit west? So I think, I think the, for me, the title means potentially many different things. Mm -hmm. So the way you've just described it is that people are exiting the West, I suppose. People are going from East to West, I think you said. So that yeah. means, um, uh, yes, people are exiting the West. Um, you can also, for example, on a stage uh, in, in theater, you know, exit stage right, exit stage yeah. left. Um, when you say exit West, it means you're exiting to the West. To the West. So, so you have both <laughs> of those things. But the, but the third part of it for me, which is quite interesting is, is that um, when people like us who come from the East mm -hmm. go and settle in the West, um, is the West still the West anymore? Was it ever the West, in mm. fact? And is this idea of the West something itself that is start, starting to disappear? Hmm. Um, uh, and so the novel sort of looks at that as well, is that, is that if the West is the idea of being this separate place, um, is that separateness con continue to exist in a world hmm. of migration? Or even beyond that, if the West is associated with certain values, um, inclusiveness, equality, this, that, the other, are those values really being upheld? And, hmm. so, and so Exit West was a, a, a play on all of these things, migrating in two different directions, and, um, and the idea of whether this thing that we call the West okay. is still the West or not. I'm skipping quickly to your 2022, The Last White Man. Okay. And I think, uh, I hope it's not an attempt like wiping the white off the map, or is it like, no white or white being brown and then brown and brown all the time? Because I think, I mean, uh, this is what I see and I have some statistics actually. I'll talk later, but can you comment on Last White Man? You want me to talk about the title? Yeah, the title. I mean, it's like, okay, yeah, there we go, like. There we go what? Like all brown. Huh? All brown. Like in the end, I mean, it's all brown, so. Why this, like, okay, last white man? Is it like post-colonial? Is it, I mean, I, I just, I'm curious to know. So, I mean, I, you know, I think that um, it's probably worth just pausing for a second. You know, the reason that one writes novels 
things that are 100, 2 or 300 pages long, is that some things are better expressed at length sure. and not reduced to sort of very small glib mm -hmm. kind of statements. You know, I think we live in a world where we imagine that the tweet or the short uh, uh, statement um, is the container of truth, mm -hmm. right? And maybe it is. But, um, you know, I, I think, you know, when you say, you know, Exit West, Last White Man, I mean, these are titles and they have, they have gestures embedded in them. But it's a little bit difficult, you know, uh, uh, to, to take a title like that and to um, express what it is trying to do in a few sentences in a talk. That said, I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to um, do that a little bit. And, and uh, so, The Last White Man is a novel in which a young man named Anders wakes up one day and he's dark. Mm -hmm. And when he went to bed the night before, he thought of himself as white. And um, he uh, uh, doesn't like this and he wants it to stop and he wants to change back to what he was. And, and this problem for him um, doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. And it begins to spread. Now, why have I written a novel in where this happens? And, you know, what uh, interested me in doing this? And, you know, what does it all mean? I mean, those are those all are sort of, I guess, long answers. But um, I think that we live in a world of increasing tribalization. Mm -hmm. um, in human history, there are epochs when um, a dominant empire uh, begins to fade. This music is very appropriate. You know, this, 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 I don't know if you can hear this music in the background, yeah, but, it is. but um, when a dominant empire begins to fade and, um, and what, what then happens is you often see this sort of fragmentation mm -hmm. and, um, and the rise of this sort of conflict and tribalization. Now, I think we live in a moment um, where, in a sense, a kind of American uh, empire is, may or may not be the right word, depending on your politics, but where a dominant American hmm. force that has shaped the world for the last you know, 75 years is beginning to fade. And as a result, what's happening is you are seeing the freeing up of localized conflicts, identities, etc. We saw when the British Empire left this part of the world, we saw the rise of, you know, the conflict between Muslims and, and, and Hindus. And when the Ottoman Empire ended, we saw um, many of the conflicts of the Balkans. When the Soviet Union ended, we were given Azerbaijan, Armenia, we were given. And so um, in this world of tribalization, um, we are seeing in a way uh, a, a retreat of people into essentialized identities. Hmm. You know, I am Pakistani, or I am Muslim, or I'm this kind of Muslim, or I'm this kind of Pakistani, or I'm white, or I'm this, I'm that. I think that this is very dangerous. Hmm. Now, I think partly the reason why this is happening is because we are um, increasingly unable to articulate a vision of the future that is both desirable and um, inclusive. The future, seems, the future seems to have become frightening to us. Hmm. Now, as a result of the future becoming frightening to us, technology is changing things very rapidly. We look ahead to the future. So many people here think, what will happen to our kids in Pakistan in the next 10, 20 years? Mm -hmm. Should we stay? Should we go? If we stay, what do we do? Can we even go? Um, this fear of the future gives rise to a politics of nostalgia. People come up and say that going back to the way that things were, mm -hmm. whether it was the caliphate, whether it was America in the 1950s, whether it was Britain before the EU, politicians all over the world are beginning to articulate these powerful nostalgic visions, which I think are misguided visions because we can't go back to the past. And the past wasn't what we thought it was in the first place. And so the question then becomes how, as a writer or an artist, do you respond to this thing? And what I wanted to do in this novel was two things. You know, I wanted to respond, one, by trying to think about a future, mm -hmm. um, a future where, in a sense, this racial conflict and even racial war 
um, begins to manifest. But yet somehow we proceed beyond that. We get to something else to sort of repopulate the future imaginatively as something we may want to actually go to. And the other part of it is, just to finish this, the other part of it is that um, I wanted to try to break down some of these barriers. Mm -hmm. In a novel where all the characters are white, which is what the last white man is, there's no main characters, four main characters, all of them are white. Mm -hmm. Written by me, somebody who's brown, the question is, if I can write these characters, mm -hmm. what does it mean? You know, if you believe in these characters and this brown person has written these white people, you know, is this racial stuff real? Um, have we just imagined this into existence? You know, does it destabilize the whole idea of race? And, um, and I think, you know, the last thing I'll say is that, is that we're living now in a moment where it's increasingly uh, the case that we are told that we need to write about people like us. Hmm. So I should write, 51 year old, mostly bald, you know, five foot nine Lahori men, right? Um, uh, but but I, I really, I think, reject that position. And um, I reject that position because you have to think of what writing is. Writing can be a representational act. And it, for many people, it's powerful when it's a representational yes. act. But writing can also be a transgressive act. Right. It can be the act of a man who wonders, what would it be like for me to be a woman? What would it be like for me to be young mm -hmm. or old? What would it be like for me to live 100 years ago or 100 years in the future? And I think that aspect of fiction and creativity is very important. So in, in many ways, The Last White Man is an attempt to, I guess, destabilize the idea of mm -hmm. race mm -hmm. and to see whether it can really stand up if we begin to play with it. Yes, Mohsen, there are so many thoughtful moments in this particular novel and I think that's part of your maturity at a point and that is what I was seeking for. But just one, my last question on your style in this particular novel. What I could see most of the time, long passages to be sentences, like sentences. Like this last one where the novel ends, I could just, from a linguistic viewpoint, pick on 31 lines paragraph, which is a whole sentence, with punctuations, of course. There are 300 words in this one sentence. There are 37 commas, one full stop, or a period. So, this style, I mean, it's very engaging, of course. Do you want to say something about this style? After all that you have written, your journey towards writing more and more, maybe better and better. Yes. So I think, um, you know, it, it sort of goes without saying, but you know, writing is built on words and it's built on sentences, it's built on form. Um, now, the idea of this novel, in a way, was to suggest that people's identity is something that's somewhat fluid, that you can flow from one position to the next, that you can change your mind, that you can change who you are. I, yeah, two minutes left. Yeah. Now, um, how do you do that, right? So for me, what I, I guess I was trying to explore in this book, uh, and the reasons why the sentences are written in this way, is that at the moment, so much of our writing uh, tweets, etc., is a kind of performative writing. Okay. We put a short sentence mm -hmm. out into the world. We then feel that we must defend the position that we've articulated because we've taken a public position. Right. This locks us into positions. I might have tweeted something, I don't tweet, but if I might have tweeted something, you know, four years ago and now somebody says, oh, why did you say this? The truth is, I don't believe this anymore. I don't know why I said that. It seems a ridiculous thing for me to have said. But I will defend it now because, you know, this is my position. It's a kind of rigidity that comes from that. Hmm. Now, what I was trying to do with these sentences is it's, you know, what happens is that, that a thought occurs. Mm -hmm. But there isn't a full stop, we flow into the next thought, hmm. and the next thought, and the next thought. A certain rhythm is established. We begin to flow from one thing to the next to the next. You have an idea, you think, is that right? You let go of the idea, you touch the next idea, you pick it up, sounds good, but maybe not. 
you qualify it. You're in your this character set, and that's you're flowing from place to place mm -hmm. to place. And so, in a sense, a novel that tries to destabilize the idea of whiteness or the idea of race um, uh, is a novel where you have to figure out how are you going to destabilize for these characters and for the reader how they think about things. Hmm. And sentences like this that, that flow without full stops but through commas that move from one place to the next were for me a way to create that effect that allows us to change our minds, to hold something in our consciousness, to discard of it and move on to something else. Thank you so much, Mohsin. And I must say, uh, particularly this last one, to be very lyrical and very thoughtful. And there are so many engaging moments in all that. Do we have time for questions or not? I don't think so. Okay. I think we have okay. I don't know. I mean, well, I'm, I'm happy sorry. To take, I'm happy to take it, but I think the next people are up. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mohsin. It was Thank lovely you. talking to you. A pleasure. <laughs>